Hi, my name is Valicia LeKay, and I am a Grammy and Tony nominated actress, singer, advocate, and proud ovarian cancer survivor. I was diagnosed with the disease in 2013 at the early age of 34. After experiencing no symptoms and having no family history of ovarian cancer, Upon being diagnosed, I began to search the internet and I noticed that none of the faces resembled me, a young black woman. It made me realize how important it is for all women to be represented and for all women to be knowledgeable about their health and how to advocate for themselves and what to look out for. That's why I'm excited to introduce Tina's Wish Empower Her series. These monthly webisodes will cover a variety of fascinating topics with top subject matter experts. The goal is educate and empower all women, regardless of race, age, location, and socioeconomic status. There are no boundaries. So let's embark on this journey together towards greater awareness about our health. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very first episode of the Tina's Wish Empower Her series, Gynecologic Cancers, Facts, and Differences. My name is Joyce Kilhaywick. I am an arts and entertainment critic. I review movies and theater, first on television for about 30 years, and now online on Joyce'sChoices.com. I am a three-time cancer survivor. Two of those cancers are ovarian cancer. My first cancer was melanoma. 10 years later, I had ovarian cancer. And a year and a half after that, I had ovarian cancer again. I've had chemo, uh, chemotherapy, I've had surgery, and I was misdiagnosed every single time. We discovered my cancers early, which is why I'm here today, because I insisted I was not well, because I got second opinions, because I found doctors who would hear me, because I trusted my body to know that I was not well, even though people gave me a clean bill of health and released me from the hospital. That's what I have learned. We have to stick up for ourselves. We have to pay attention. We have to seek information. We have to insist on how we feel, on getting second opinions, and on making our way through the system. And then I was lucky enough to find doctors who could treat me. That is really what today is all about and what Empower Her is all about, about getting information that will empower you. And getting that information as early as possible is so important because the truth of your diagnosis, the truth of your cancer will out. The earlier you can face that and get information and insist and don't be afraid to challenge, the better off you're going to be. I am so excited to moderate today's panel. And before we get started, I would like to give a very big thank you to our sponsoring partners and our community partners. We are so honored to join forces on this initiative. As you've heard, the goal of the Empower Her series is for all attendees to walk away from these webisodes with a wealth of really helpful knowledge and information. The monthly webisodes are going to cover a variety of topics relating to gynecologic health. Every webisode is going to last 30 to 40 minutes, features subject matter experts, and will offer closed captioning in both English and Spanish. To view closed captioning, just click the English or Spanish button that is right under the live stream on the event website. And now I'm going to try that in Spanish. Para ver los subtítulos, Tan solo haga clic en el botón de inglés o español que se encuentra justo debajo de la transmisión en vivo 
on la página web del evento. Please forgive any mispronunciations. This is a very inclusive journey and we are so honored to have all of you here with us. During the panel, please feel free to type your questions for our team and we will take a few questions from the audience at the end. You can type your questions to the doctors in the Q&A box on this website. And now we're going to welcome our panelists, both from New York, Dr. Leslie Boyd, gynecologic oncologist from NYU Langone's Perlmutter Cancer Center, and Dr. Kara Long Roche, gynecologic oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Welcome to both of you. Dr. Boyd, we're going to start with you. What is gynecologic cancer? And please define who a gynecologic oncologist is and what exactly do they do? Hi, Joyce. Thanks for these questions and thanks for uh, emceeing this great event. Um, gynecologic cancer are cancers that arise out of the female reproductive tract. So the most common GYN cancers are ovarian, um, uterine, cervical, fallopian tube, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. Not in correct order, I will say. Um, and gynecologic oncologists are doctors who train in taking care of women with malignancies in those areas, in the women's reproductive tract. Interestingly, unlike other oncologists, most gynecologic oncologists are trained to give both chemotherapy and perform surgery. So we are trained to take care of kind of the totality of the needs for patients in these areas. And Dr. Long, I'm aware that there are many differences among these kinds of cancers. So let's start with incidence. Which of these cancers is the most common gynecologic cancer? Um, well, worldwide, uh, cervical cancer is the most common gynecologic cancer, but here in the United States, um, where women have access to gynecologists and pap smears, um, endometrial cancer, which is cancer of the lining of the uterus, is the most common uh, gynecologic cancer in this country. Um, and it is something that we see every day in our practices here. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about mortality rate. And I think I may know the answer to this question, but which is the cancer, which gynecologic cancer has the highest mortality rate? So uh, in the United States, the gynecologic cancer that has the highest mortality rate is ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. actually. Um, it's not the most common cancer, but it is one of the hardest gynecologic cancers to treat and cure because unfortunately, most women with ovarian cancer are diagnosed when the disease has already spread um, outside of the ovary or the fallopian tube mm -hmm. um, into the patient's abdomen. And so um, patients present um, with advanced stage disease, which unfortunately is harder to treat and cure. And that's because it's so hard to find and diagnose. Yes. Um, some of the challenges that we face with ovarian cancer treatment are that there are um, very few symptoms of ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer when it is in its early stages. And currently, um, we have no screening test or early detection tests which reliably can find ovarian or fallopian tube cancer when it is small and early. So uh, that leads me to uh, a question for you, Dr. Boyd. How many of the gynecologic cancers actually do have screening tests or screening methods? Uh, you know, and when I go to my annual physical, when I get a pap smear, is that a good screening test for gynecologic cancers? Pap smears are excellent screening tests, especially when combined with a high-risk HPV test for cervical cancer. But cervix cancer is the only cancer it's designed to screen for. So unfortunately, we're left without screening tests for ovarian cancer, which, as we discussed, mm -hmm. is, a, is a huge problem. Endometrial cancer, although there's no screening test, thankfully, there's usually an early warning system, meaning that you generally have abnormal bleeding. So although we don't have a screening test for it, we do commonly find it relatively early. So unfortunately, really, cervical cancer is the only cancer for which we have a good screening strategy. 
Right. And my mother actually was diagnosed with endometrial cancer and she did have an early morning and there was some bleeding. Otherwise, there would have been no way for us to even know. And they caught that very, very early. Uh, Dr. Long, since cervical cancer is the only one with really an early detection test, uh, certainly it's very important to be aware of all the signs and symptoms of gynecologic cancers. What are some of the warning signs for some gynecologic cancers that we should all be looking for? Um, that's a great question, and it's something that I think every patient should be aware of. Um, any patient that has um, abnormal bleeding, um, so that's bleeding outside of the usual menstrual cycle pattern, so irregular bleeding, irregular periods, bleeding in between periods, or very, very heavy bleeding um, should always be evaluated by a gynecologist. Um, also, any bleeding at all, even if very, very light or scant after a patient has gone through menopause, um, should be evaluated right away. And in many cases, um, it is the patients that present immediately for evaluation of that postmenopausal bleeding who were able to find uterine or endometrial cancer when it's early and very curable. Mm -hmm. Other signs and symptoms are things like bloating difficulty eating a full meal, pain in the pelvis or the abdomen, mm -hmm. um, painful intercourse, changes with bowel function or bladder habits. Mm -hmm. And then a, another symptom that many people don't know about is any itching um, or, um, or discomfort on the vulva or the vagina. So if there's one spot that's persistently bothersome, um, that can be a sign of vulvar cancer. Very interesting. Um, I know looking back on my own ovarian cancer, and I had those cancers when I was pretty young, I mean, 34, 35, 36, I had almost no symptoms except bloating, frequent urinary tract infections. Um, and once I got so full, I couldn't finish a meal and I eat like a horse. So this was, you know, these are things that all together could, might have suggested this. And even so, it was very hard to, to diagnose. But I just wanted to put that out there because these symptoms can be really subtle. Um, Dr. Boyd, are there certain risk factors for gynecologic cancers? And what are there, way, are there ways to reduce those risks? Yeah, again, one of the most effective ways to reduce the risk of GYN cancers that we have, you know, there's a vaccine now that is effective against many uh, subtypes of HPV, which is the causative agent of cervix cancer. So cervical cancer, in addition to having an effective screening tool, also has an effective um, way to avoid the cancer. So, so that vaccine, we really strongly suggest that all girls are vaccinated, uh, generally ages 10 and 11, prior to uh, intercourse mm -hmm. so that they can avoid cervix cancer uh, later in life. At highest use, we think that vaccine will prevent about 75% of cervix cancers. Mm -hmm. And in countries that have had a high use of the vaccine, they've already seen a tremendous decrease in their cervical cancer um, load. So yeah, it can so be good. effective if yeah. used. Um, beyond that, um, other risk factors, or, well, Family history is really important thing to talk about in patients, certainly with ovary and fallopian tube cancers and in some uterine cancers as well. So for those patients, certainly they can be associated with genetic mutations such as the BRCA1 and 2 mutations and several others. And oftentimes those patients will have extensive family histories with other uh, people in the family with either breast or ovarian cancer. That's mm -hmm. something important to know about. Uterine cancer can be associated with a different genetic uh, predisposition called Lynch syndrome, and that can cluster both um, endometrial and colon cancer, as well as ovarian and some other cancers less frequently. So also an important thing to know about. Other risk factors, generally speaking, obesity tends to be a risk factor. Um, but aside from that, those are, those are the most important. So Dr. Boyd, I'm just curious about the BRCA gene mutation as a risk factor. So many people seem to have that as a risk factor. Lots of people are getting genetic studies done and we get a lot of questions about that. How much of a risk factor is that? Yeah, so the BRCA 
one and two gene mutations, and there's actually some other mutations that are related, make up about 15 to 20 percent of all epithelial ovarian cancers, the kind of ovarian cancer that uh, we are most worried about. So it's clearly much more common to get a non-familial associated cancer, but for those people who have the mutation, their risk of developing an ovary or fallopian tube cancer is quite high. Depending on the mutation, it can vary between 20 to 65% lifetime risk. And that compares to a lifetime risk of about one and a half percent for the general population. So we're talking about a really extraordinary increase in risk of developing these cancers. I'm understanding that there is a way to reduce your risk of ovarian cancer if you've taken birth control. Is that true? That is a great comment. Yes. So being on hormonal birth control, any type for a minimum of two years and preferably to at least five years, once you hit five years, you reduce your risk by about 50%. And that's true even if you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So it's a common strategy that we have for our patients who are carriers. We ask them to go on oral contraceptive pills so that we know we can mitigate this risk for them. Who knew? Honestly, when birth control first came out, we all thought it might kill us, you know. Um, and now we find out it might actually be a really good thing right. in terms of ovarian cancer at any rate. Uh, and, you know, in my case, I fell outside of all of those risk factors. There was no ovarian in my family. Uh, I'm a really healthy person, et cetera, et cetera. So while those things are and I don't have that gene mutation. They looked at my right. gene panel and said, that's the most boring gene panel we've ever seen. So there's sometimes there's just no explanation and we just need to be watching, watching ourselves. Um, right. Dr. Long, how do you treat gynecologic cancers? Uh, the treatment of gynecologic cancers is very individualized, um, meaning we, um, evaluate um, lots of different factors when determining a treatment plan, um, the patient and their overall health, um, what organ um, has the disease, and then what type of cancer cell is affecting that organ. So there are different types of cancer cells mm -hmm. um, that can be found in these, you know, the particular gynecologic um, organs. And we also look at the distribution of disease. And that helps us to determine the plan for a particular patient. Very often, surgery is part of the plan. Um, surgery to remove any visible um, or palpable tumor or disease. Um, and then in certain patients, additional treatments are needed. Um, some medical treatments um, like chemotherapy or other drugs that have been developed um, that target these cancer cells. And then in some cases, radiation therapy. Um, so for example, cervical cancer is very often treated with a combination of radiation and chemotherapy, um, sometimes also with surgery. And ovarian cancer is more likely to be treated with surgery and medical therapy like chemotherapy. I think uh, we should take some questions from the audience. I know everything you've said so far has probably made bells go off in some people's heads about what to do, what to look for. So um, we have a, a first question here. Uh, and the question is, if I am experiencing symptoms of a gynecologic cancer, should I first bring it up to my regular OBGYN? Um, at what point would I go see a gynecologic oncologist? And what if there is not a gynecologic oncologist in my local community? This is a great question. I wasn't sure who to go to when I was having these symptoms. I didn't, I didn't know. It hurt somewhere around my stomach. I didn't know whether I should see my regular doctor, my OBGYN or somebody else. I didn't know. Either, either one of you can jump in there. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that one. I think it's a great question. Um, it is reasonable to go to either your primary care physician or probably preferably your gynecologist to get evaluated. Um, the one comment I would make is that persistent symptoms deserve a full evaluation. 
And so oftentimes patients will be told, oh, don't worry, it's just a GI thing or it's a passing bug. And I would be relatively insistent about getting a pelvic ultrasound depending on, on the symptoms. An ultrasound is, is uh, relatively non-invasive, um, relatively inexpensive, and quite available. You should be able to get one in most places. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a perfectly reasonable place to start, of course, after a good history and, and physical examination. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage people to be a really good advocate for themselves. I've, I've had too many patients, unfortunately, who have been pushed off and told that they were fine, only to come to see me a year later with an advanced cancer. Of course, that's, that's not the common thing that happens, right? But it does happen, unfortunately. So we have to advocate for ourselves in these institute in these in times. Yeah, I, I amen to that. I have heard that story a lot. That uh, I think it's very important to insist when things keep coming up, when symptoms persist, and then you've maybe got to go to a specialist and and pass and get a second opinion from someone else who may be able to zero in on that. Uh, is there anything you wanted to add to that, Doctor Long? I echo everything that Dr. Boyd said. Um, uh, any symptom that is lasting, you know, more than a week or two and doesn't go away should be evaluated. Um, and I completely agree that if uh, a patient is told that something is nothing, but they keep having symptoms, that they should feel empowered to um, continue to advocate for a more complete workup. Um, and, you know, it is difficult. Gynecologic oncologists are very, very uh, numerous in New York City, uh, but there are places in the country um, and certainly the world where there are not gynecologic oncologists. And I think um, that, you know, communication with the specialists or the, the OBGYNs in your area as to how best to get the care that you need is the most important first step. You know, you're making me think of one other important point that I think comes up for women, and that is women often don't like to challenge a doctor. And I always say to people that a good doctor welcomes input, welcomes second opinions, will actually facilitate that for you and make that happen. Um, no one likes to really challenge their doctor, but your first duty is really to yourself and your own health. And I will say that if I had not challenged my doctors, and I love my doctors, but if I hadn't challenged some of my doctors, I wouldn't be here today. And that's the most important thing. Uh, we have another question here, and that is, should women consider clinical trials after being diagnosed with cancer? Uh, I, can, I can answer that. Um, clinical trials are, are a wonderful thing. Um, this is where all the new, um, and better treatments begin. Um, whether there is an appropriate clinical trial for a particular patient is a decision um, that will be made between them and their and their treating doctor. Uh, so um, a gynecologic oncologist should be able to guide patients um, whether um, there is a, an additional option other than the standard treatment that might be right for them. Um, and if there is, um, we always encourage patients to consider. Mm -hmm. um, clinical trials um, are not always the right decision for a patient, but in many cases they are. And again, in many cases, it's an opportunity to get treatment and something that might be newer and you know more effective. And it certainly is a way to help uh, help science in a sense. I mean, I. I uh, would always welcome the opportunity to be part of a clinical trial um, because it adds to the, the larger body of information that's going to help all of us. So it's a way that it's almost a way you can kind of give back while you're doing your own treatment, uh, if I may. We have a question here about cysts, ovarian cysts. If you've been diagnosed with an ovarian cyst, is that something that could be a precursor for ovarian cancer? So I'm happy to talk about this. The vast majority of ovarian cysts are benign, meaning they are not cancerous. And the ovaries, certainly in a premenopausal patient, they make cysts for a living. That's kind of what they do. So, you know, having normal ovulatory function means that you're going to have cysts in your ovaries. 
So having an ovarian cyst is not necessarily bad. We are really lucky to be in a time where imaging techniques are so easy to come by. And again, ultrasound, I will point to. So we can use how the cyst looks on ultrasound to risk stratify whether or not we need to be worried about that cyst. Again, the vast majority of cysts will have really benign looking characteristics and usually just need follow up unless they're symptomatic because of their size. It's really a small minority that have worrisome characteristics which if present should prompt the gynecologist to send that patient to a GYN oncologist for further evaluation. Okay, so don't panic if you get diagnosed with a cyst. It's most likely okay. It doesn't mean you're going to have cancer. Okay, good to know. Can, Can you tell us about some of the hopeful research progress that's being made right now for treatments, for early detection, Uh, methods for figuring out how to diagnose these gynecologic cancers early and treat them once we have them? Sure. That's a a broad question, but happy to discuss it. There are a lot of new imaging modalities that are constantly being evaluated. Um, Certainly ovarian cancer and I'll say ovarian and fallopian tube cancer, because often they are, are kind of grouped together, are, as we discussed earlier, really problematic because we tend to find them quite late in the disease process. And if we could identify them earlier, we would do so much better. Our current standard, which is ultrasound um, and, you know, and really waiting for symptoms. We don't have a good screening test for standard patients or routine patients um, really is not acceptable. So if we can get better technology, then patients will do better. And and certainly that's in the works. That's true both for imaging studies as well as um, blood tests. So looking at different tumor markers and combinations of tumor markers with imaging studies to see if we can identify a trend that shows that something is happening, kind of a a precancerous state. We don't don't seem to be able to find that yet. And and a marker would be something you might find in a blood test? Correct. So right now we use a CA-125 commonly as a marker to follow patients with their disease. Um, Not everyone who has ovarian and fallopian tube cancer will have an elevated CA-125, but for those with advanced disease, about 75 to 85% of them will. And for them, it's helpful to follow their disease course. However, using it in screening has been far more problematic because again, it's much less likely to be elevated in early stages and and far less so kind of in a pre, there's no precancerous state that we've really identified well for ovary and fallopian tube cancer. Mm -hmm. And if we could do that, then we could intervene early. Mm. Got it. Are there any other uh, research studies that you're aware of Dr. Long or any other kinds of studies that, and advances that people are making around diagnosing gynecologic cancers earlier and treating them earlier? Um, well, we, uh, we are using some novel uh, technologies. So for example, um, some of the researchers um, at our various institutions are looking at machine learning. So having a computer look at fluid samples and blood samples to see if, if the computer can do a little better than we can by looking at patterns of proteins in the blood and in the fluid to try to identify very, very early subtle changes that might be associated with um, with an early ovarian cancer or fallopian tube cancer. Wow. Um, and in doing that, looking at proteins that we may not even be able to name or identify, but if the machine or the computer can identify these patterns, we may be able to translate that one day to a screening test in the clinic. Do either of you have any additional advice you wanna share with us before we leave today? Something that would help everybody out there who's really wanting to take charge of their gynecologic health. Uh, One thing that I think is very important uh, for all patients to know about their own personal history Um, is whether they might be at risk for carrying one of these genetic mutations that would elevate their risk of developing an ovarian or fallopian tube cancer, um, but also other cancers like breast cancer or uterine cancer. 
one easy way um, to um, look into your own risk of whether you might carry one of these mutations is to talk to your doctor in depth about your family history, not just your parents and your siblings, but their parents, their siblings, cousins, um, and to let your doctor look over your family history to see whether there are any worrisome patterns, um, whether cancer runs um, on one particular side of the family, um, and then your doctor can help decide whether you should have genetic testing. Genetic testing is um, as easy as a blood test, um, and it can give you a wealth of information about your own risk. And that, in turn, can lead you to doctors who can help you to decrease that risk. And for gynecologic cancers specifically, if we know that a patient has a genetic mutation, we can help to counsel them so that they can opt for individualized risk-reducing strategies and plans to help take that very high risk that Dr. Boyd was mentioning very, very far down to, to almost average risk. Um, and so that's just the last thing is just talk to your doctor about your family history and whether genetic testing is right for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I'm very encouraged by all of this, as a matter of fact. So thank you so very much. Um, don't worry if any of you out there have questions that we did not get to. The Tina's Wish team is going to address all your unanswered questions in follow-up email, which is a blast that's going to go out early next week. And that email will also have a full recording of this session and also a lot of helpful resources about gynecologic cancers. So uh, you want to stay tuned for that. Just want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Long and Dr. Boyd for joining us, being so candid, so open, and so available to all of us together as we take charge of our health. Thank you so much. You're on the front lines there, and we uh, we thank you for everything you're doing to improve the lives of women. Uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. This is just fantastic. It is not the end. Stay tuned for more information about webisode number two, which is going to air sometime in early March. In the meantime, to all of you, be well, take care, wear a mask, be peaceful. Take care.